Our scripture today comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 to 31. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those of us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where's the scribe? Where's the debater of the age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, for God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Consider your own calls, call brothers and sisters. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not, to reduce to nothing things that are, so that no one might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption in order that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. I recently shared this slide on Facebook. I don't remember where it came from, but it expresses some things about Jesus that we would do well to remember. It says, and it was supposed to be a New Year's resolution, this year, I want to be more like Jesus. Hang out with sinners, upset religious people, tell stories that make people think, choose unpopular friends, be kind, loving, and merciful take naps on boats. And a Facebook friend commented, you forgot righteously flip table, tables over once in a while. <clears throat> the problem is we have domesticated and sanitized Jesus. Mm -hmm. He doesn't make us at least a little bit uncomfortable. We're not doing this Christianity thing right. Let's take a look at a few things out of the ordinary that Jesus did before we move on to today's scripture. Think to yourself whether you, if you'd been raised a good law-abiding Jewish person in Jesus' day, would have followed him or rejected him. And this isn't an exhaustive search, but it's what I found. When he was 12, we are told, he stayed behind in Jerusalem after Passover without his parents' permission or knowledge. He spent 40 days in the wilderness and was tempted by Satan. Oh, and which is from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Luke. He said for people to love their enemies, Matthew 5 and Luke 6. He touched lepers, Matthew 8, Mark 1, Luke 5. He forgave sins, Mark 2, Luke 5. He called tax collectors to follow him and ate with tax collectors and sinners, Mark 2, Luke 5. He did work, healing and plucking grain, on the Sabbath, Matthew 12, Mark 3, Luke 4, 6, 13, 14, and John 5. He claimed that whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother, other than his biological family, which comes from Mark, Matthew 12, Mark 3, and Luke 8. He calmed the storm, Matthew 8, Mark 4, Luke 8. He overturned the tables of the money changers in the temple, Matthew 21, Mark 11, Luke 19, John 2. He denounced the hypocrisy of the scribes and Pharisees, Matthew 15 and 23, Mark 12, Luke 11, 12 and 20. 
he talked to women he wasn't related to, which no respectable Jewish man in his day would have done. And it wasn't just the respectable women like Mary and Martha, but unclean women, like the woman with an issue of blood who touched his garment, Matthew 9, Luke 8, foreign women like the Canaanite in Matthew 15 or the Syrophoenician in Mark 7, who asked for her daughter to be healed, to scandalous women like the woman taken in adultery, John 8, the woman who anointed his feet, Luke 8 and John 12, and the woman at the well, John 4, the last of whom was a hated Samaritan. Plus, he and his disciples were supported by women. They provided for them out of their resources, as we learn in a throwaway verse in Luke 8. As the song pointed out, even his family thought he was mad. I had to look that one up the first time I heard the song. It's from Mark 3, 21. And John 7 says that not even his brothers believed him. And that doesn't even count healing people and raising them from the dead. Jairus' daughter in Mark 5, Luke 8, the widow's son in Luke 7, and Lazarus, John 11, and other miracles that people like to explain away like changing water to wine at the wedding in Cana, John 2, feeding thousands, Matthew 14, 15, Mark 6, 8, Luke 9, John 6, and walking on water, Matthew 14, Mark 6, John 6. So how did people know, or rather, how did some people know that Jesus was the real deal? And why did others, specifically the scribes, Pharisees, and Romans in particular, think that he was nothing but a low-life rabble-rouser and a troublemaker? We believe, but is that just because most of us have heard these stories all of our lives, because we know how the story ends? Like I asked earlier, if we didn't know the rest of the story, and encountered Jesus on the street in some little town in Judea back then, would we have been able to see who he really was, despite the religious authorities, the scribes and the Pharisees, saying that he was wrong to do the things that he did? And that, of course, is where discernment comes in. We have this letter from Paul, as Wayne mentioned last week, because the saints in Corinth were having problems. Paul had received reports that the people had divided into factions, some claiming to follow Paul, others claiming to follow Peter, others claiming to follow Apollos, who, by the way, was a Christian Jew from Alexandria, who was a friend of Peter's, others claiming to follow Christ, the anointed one. And by the way, the anointed one is the actual translation of the titles Christos and Messiah. Some people were doubtless claiming to be wiser. Others were claiming to be holier than thou. Each jostling to be the smartest, the most, the biggest, the best. In the theology class, we're currently studying a book called After Jesus Before Christianity, and are learning that for about the first 200 years after Jesus' resurrection, there was not an organized church. There were just lots of little groups that started meeting together presumably after hearing someone like Paul or Peter or Apollos preach, and sometimes with their help, as Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians, forming a, a little community. This group in Corinth is called Chloe's people or Chloe's household, and they probably met in her house. Really, we just don't know a whole lot about them. And this is long before the part of the New Testament, other than Paul's letters, was written down. And we don't know how widely Paul's letters were distributed, so they probably had at most the Jewish scriptures that we call the Old Testament, but that would probably only happen if some of the members of the group were originally Jewish, which, according to Acts, was the case in Chloe's group. So, no scriptures about the life of Jesus, no enduring principles, no mission initiatives, no hierarchy, no structure of leadership, no rules, no teaching other than what they received initially and occasionally from the visiting missionaries, who may or may not have always emphasized the same things. Frankly, I'd be more surprised if they did, if they didn't have disagreements. By all their arguing on what Paul later calls doubtful disputations, they were missing the main point. For Jews to demand signs, 
and Greeks desire wisdom, but we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. The main problem here apparently is that Jesus and his crucifixion don't match the group's preconceived notion of what the basis of a new faith should be. Stumbling block is translated from the Greek scandalon, the same word from which we get the English word scandal. Think about it. What could be more scandalous to your standard God-fearing Jew in Jesus' day than to be crucified naked as a common criminal in view of everyone? Now, if Jesus had in fact come down off the cross and overturned the Romans, that kind of sign would have made sense to most of the Jews of his day, showing the world that Jesus really was the Messiah, at least the way they perceived the Messiah. The Greeks prized wisdom. It's probably important here to remember that Corinth, though part of the, then part of the Roman Empire, is a city in Greece. And Greeks believed that wisdom and intelligence were of the utmost importance. They prided themselves on making decisions based on information, not ignorance. You know, just the facts, ma'am. The idea that a religion could be based on a mere man, not an ancient god or hero, who was executed as an enemy of the state was ridiculous to many of them. Now, truthfully, I can empathize with those Greeks because I've always wanted to know. I was sure that if something was true, God would always reveal it to me in my mind. And that's why this song, God's Own Fool, affected me so much, especially when it says, so surrender the hunger to say you must know, have the courage to say I believe. As I've grown older, I've acknowledged that there are things that will happen that I just don't and can't wrap my mind around. And sometimes I think it's because God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. As my favorite commentary says, nothing could be more unlikely than that redemption should come through the humiliating crucifixion of someone. Nothing could be more alien to the culture, its social structures and practices. Paul is saying that Jesus' horrible, painful, shameful, spiteful, and yes, embarrassing execution was significant. Life-giving, wise, and vitally important. And this is the opposite of what you'd expect of earthly wisdom, power, and nobility. Jesus' crucifixion was ironically one of the things that drew some of the people to him, according to after Jesus before Christianity. It says that people beaten down by Rome told the story of Jesus' crucifixion openly and celebrated it partly as an act of resistance to Rome. If Jesus was king, then Caesar wasn't. Jesus had been crucified like thousands throughout the empire, empire so he w must be the kind of king who wouldn't do the crucifying. Most communities of the anointed of the first and second century publicly acknowledge the paradox that Rome's defeat of Jesus the anointed was actually Rome's defeat, since most of the stories of Jesus' crucifixion also proclaimed that Jesus was vindicated and raised up by God. The good news to them was the coming of the anointed which changed their experience from a life of fear, separation, and subjugation to lives of hope, solidarity, and community. What made the difference for these communities was caring for one another, bestowing forgiveness, being fed, finding a future, and being surrounded by companions, according to the book. So what is Jesus, what is God's foolishness that's wiser than human wisdom? and God's weakness that is stronger than human strength. It is Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, Paul tells us. Contrary to everything the group in Corinth had learned and believed in the past, Paul proclaims Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. He proclaimed that God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weakness in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, things that are not to reduce to nothing, things that are. And as my song says, 
the power of paradox opens your eyes and blinds those who say they can see. So, if we didn't have an established church in scripture, how would we know? How would we discern what God was calling us to? For some, it's even though we have churches and scriptures. First, I think we need to look to the source. What do we see in Jesus? What do we know about God? How do we overcome our preconceived notions about God? What is the Holy Spirit teaching us and calling us to do? We are fortunate enough to have many scriptures about that. But ultimately, we need to take Jesus seriously, not just believing the stories about him, but believing him, especially in my mind, as we're told that he says in Mark 12, quoting the old scripture from Deuteronomy, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, with all your mind and with all your strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And from John 13, I give you a new commandment that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also should love one another. Paul talks about those who are called. Let us be sure to answer. Please join us now in the sending forth hymn, send